Perspective tonight from the majority leader. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Welcome aboard. Everybody likes Joe Sicacci. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody does. I've never heard anybody say a nary a bad word about him. Um, no, I, I, and I, I'm in that club. Getting great answers is a whole nother story. So we're going to see what, what, what success I have tonight with the kind of enigmatic politician in, in, in a way. He's got more money than God in his campaign fund. He's been sitting on it for a while. We really don't know what, what is up his um, political sleeve, but he is, of course, playing a significant role in the leadership of the State House right now. And he presides over a district flat in the city that is, I think, other than Providence, in the most turmoil. So there's a lot to talk about. Great to have you aboard. Of course, the president just won't quit. He just won't quit. It's it's it, his it, it is he's irrepressive when it comes to this 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 dialogue that he wants to sponsor headline here, uh, and now he's going after Cummings, what? President Trump doubled down in his attacks on Maryland Congressman Elijah Cummings and his Baltimore district while defending himself. There is nothing racist in stating plainly what most people already know, that Elijah Cummings has done a terrible job for the people of his district and of Baltimore itself, the president tweeted on Sunday. Widespread backlash continues to mount after the president on Saturday called Cummings District a disgusting rat and rodent infested mess where no human being would want to live. Unbelievable that we have a president of the United States who attacks uh, American cities, who attacks Americans. The headline of a scathing editorial in the Baltimore Sun reads, Better to have a few rats than to be one. On CBS Face the Nation, White House Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney said the tweets were not racist. The president is pushing back against what he sees as wrong. It's how he's done in the past, and he'll continue to do it in the future. Mulvaney says President Trump is reacting to Cummings' comments about conditions at federal migrant detention centers at the border. Cummings had this recent exchange during a hearing with Acting Homeland Security Secretary Kevin McAleenan. We're doing our level best in a very... What does that mean? What does that mean when a child is sitting in their own feces, can't take a shower, Come on, man. Cummings, who is chairman of the House Oversight Committee, is leading multiple investigations aimed at the president. Yeah, Elijah Cummings is 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 a leader that, that I think deserves just about everybody's respect. The, the city of Baltimore's urban challenges are not unlike many urban cities, and uh, they're complicated, no doubt. Uh, it's funny, you know, we, we talk about rats when it comes to the Providence Schools report, but that was something that was generated from anecdotal discussion and evidence from the Johns Hopkins study. Referring to a place as rat infested is a different, is a different ball game. And the president knows it. It's not even dog whistling. It's just like blow torching through. You people in urban America, you, you black people, uh, and then fill in the blank. And everybody knows it. And so few want to say it. And that's the America that we have right now. It's too bad. It really is. Uh, one day after the next, and the heat is on, man. He is on a roll. He thinks he is, anyway. Next issue here in Rhode Island. I'm going to get our guest perspective on this. City leaders extend Olive Branch. It seems like they've kind of worked it out in Warwick. Here was our last report there. The Warwick School Committee officially accepts and approves an additional $4 million in funding from the city, a solution after hours and hours of meetings, both in public and behind closed doors. You know, we extended an olive branch and they did as well. The school committee has agreed to spend the money on a list of prioritized items. The additional funding brings back clubs and school sports and pays for textbooks, academic tools, training for teachers and more. We're trusting you and we need to make sure we can continue to trust you. Each school committee member spoke, thanking the public for their patience and involvement, proud of where they landed. But as the chairwoman notes, the school department is still working with $4 million less than what they initially asked for. We're, we're very excited. 
Um, we don't have all the money in the world, and there are things that we can't restore at this time. At this week's city council meeting, the city council president told Eyewitness News the additional funding comes from shuffling things around in the city's budget. Mayor Solomon also told us he's confident it will work out financially. The most important thing to remember is whether you're on a sports team, a drama team, uh, an academic team, or a school committee team, it's all about teamwork. That's your city. Yes. Welcome. Welcome. Good thank to see you. you. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Something's wrong. There's no systemic change. There's this accumulated deficit of gosh knows what quantified millions of dollars. It's, it's, it's double-digit millions. School committee says, don't have it. We're seven million short and four million here and no city comes up and makes a, a, a resolved promise. I see no specific, I, I know where they took the money from, but there's no specific systemic change in the way they operate, nor was there a cash infusion. What happened there? Are you paying attention to that? Yes, I am paying attention. And the money came primarily from an account they were going to use for road resurfacing, a paving account. I think they tapped that for three million of the four million, and I think the other million came from administrative savings. We have a lot of what we call breakage in the city, which means we have a lot of unfilled positions. We don't have a city solicitor. The mayor doesn't really have a chief of staff, so there's a lot of personnel cuts that he has, you know, jobs he hasn't filled, and that's where some of that savings is coming from. I think that you're going to see as things move forward some changes significant there has to be changes I think they're coming and I think the mayor's been doing a good job it hasn't been easy it's not easy we have our challenges in city uh, Warwick just like every other city in town but he works very hard he's a lawyer he's an accountant he knows what he's doing and he every single day he's on the job so I, I think we have good things to come in the city of Warwick. I'm the eternal optimist, but that's also not just because I'm an optimist. I happen to see it. I see companies that want to come to Warwick, big national companies, hotels want to come to Warwick. We, we just permitted a brand new Marriott on Post Road. Tesla opened up in Warwick. I can't, I'm not at liberty to tell you, but there are two other national big companies and names that you would easily know that want to come and relocate to Warwick. So good things are going to come to the city of Warwick. We have to be patient. It's why nobody doesn't like you. That you find you find a uh, a ripe piece of fruit in a in a in a foul basket of fruit. You find the the silver lining in everything. It's that my, mayor has been that mayor has been incompetent in explaining himself. He has been insufficient in 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 his approach to what seems like a little bit of a corruption problem there. He has provided no accountability and or consistency from Scott Abadesian's whatever mess to his own. He has pulled his punches. He has marbled his words. He has lied to me on two separate occasions about issues that go on in that city. I don't know, Joe. It's, uh, it's interesting the way people look at things. Uh, I fear for the leadership in that city. And by the way, if there was $3 million budgeted to pave roads in a place where all of Rhode Island suffers from pothole heaven and real infrastructure problems, how is that a solution? It's a temporary solution to, I don't want to use the word crisis, but to an immediate problem. And it would take a, a long time to spend that amount of money. So hopefully there'll be other ways that that money can be supplemented or you know, repatriated. You flirted with being the mayor, didn't you? I wouldn't use the word flirt. I considered it. I think a lot of people around me expected me to run. A lot of people were talking about it. Some people were actually wagering friendly bets that I was going to run. Uh, I thought about it, but I'm, you know, truthfully, I'm very happy in the house. I, I really like the job I have. I like the interaction I have. I get along very well with the speaker, and I get along very well with all of the members of the house. That you know, the is that what it's about? Progressive. Is, is, is that what it's about? And I, I yeah, asked. And, this, I asked I, this. Let me is finish. It I'm about? Fin is it about? getting along no is that, is that, is that, is that, is that no, what that's makes not, that, you no, feel accomplished no it, no it makes my job makes what I what I really want to do which is to get things done easy and enjoyable 
you know, if you find a job that you like, you never have to work a day in your life. And I have found a job that I like, which is being in the House. And I enjoy it very much, and I've been productive. I passed significant pieces of legislation, not just this year or the last two years that I've been majority leader, but even as a freshman I did. So now I'm in an environment where I, I can get a lot of things done. I enjoy it. I mean, it's almost like sometimes in politics, if you don't, if you're not happy doing it, you must not be doing a good job. But I feel like I'm doing a good job, and I'm happy at it. Why did you and the Speaker support an evergreen contract that really has put the pressure on cities when it comes to holding down the fort um, in education expense? Uh, for a lot of reasons, but primarily because there were a couple of communities that did not honor the uh, philosophy behind Evergreen. There were a couple of communities, one I believe was East Providence, and then I, get, I think it was North Kingstown. There has always been an unwritten rule in the labor community when a contract expired and you begin negotiations the other one, you honor the contract going forward. Unfortunately, some communities decided not to do that. This was a big push about three years ago. We passed it, I think, two years ago, and then the governor vetoed it. It came back before the General Assembly this year in a modified form. So let me tell you, because I, I have done a lot of interviews or requests about Evergreen, and what I tell everybody is please read the bill, or in this case, the law, because there's two specific sections of the law that are very city and town friendly. And no one seems to talk about that. I haven't heard it on your show. I haven't seen it in the media. I haven't seen it in the newspaper. But there were two clauses in there. One is it that, which does not become evergreen, is if any kind of arbitration clauses are in the original contract, they do not become evergreen. They actually st stay in a force, and ar arbitration is still a viable tool. It doesn't disappear. And most importantly, the cities and towns have the unilateral right to lay off any member. So that doesn't go away. No. So if you were in a contract, maybe you missed a few shows because we talked about both. Arbitration has always I been did. culturally union friendly, I, and 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 the idea that you can put a gun to their head and operate that way is not the way that mayors want to run these cities. I totally agree with you. And the the, the way to sol to do that solution is at the bargaining table. All right. When we come back, some really really hot issues in the state right now, uh, including this uh, largest non-taxable form of revenue. Stay with us. This isn't the business they're in, and this is the third biggest source of revenue for Rhode Island. I think it would be incredibly risky to turn over this to a business that has zero track record in it. Although I think the governor, once again, with her really low-performing communication staff and advisors, and her own instinct, which is like tin ear on, on many things, is, is ultimately correct that IGT is probably the best, is, is no doubt the best vendor to supply the gaming machines for this state. Twin Rivers hedge fund company ownership now making a move on this is a fascinating big money drama in, in Rhode Island. What's your gut check on what's happening with this situation? It's going to play out on uh, General Assembly. Uh, it's a very important contract. It's big for the state, but it's also big for the you know, private gambling titans of Rhode Island, and everybody wants either a piece of the pie or a bigger piece of the pie. It is a feeding frenzy. There isn't a consultant or a lobbyist that can walk or chew gum at the same time that hasn't either been put on the bench or the active roster for either one of these two major entities. It, and it, frankly, they're all mercenaries because they get each flip, flip they could both flip, you know, all of them could flip coins as to who they'd want to represent because nobody's doing this out of, nobody's working on behalf of these companies out of um, deep conviction. It's been a job security for the lobbies at the State House in the off season and off election year. Yeah. Well, why don't you change that, by the way? It's the culture. The what culture is there's just the culture of, of, of the feeding frenzy that goes on in this state and the, the amount of money that people make off the fights that go on on big picture issues yeah. in the state is, I, is, is quite something. I can't know, or anybody can control who IGT hires or who uh, Twin River hires. They're private individual corporations, both publicly traded, sure. and they can hire whomever yeah, they want. Yeah, but who can step into the state house is a whole other ball game. It's a side issue. Mm -hmm. What's going on with your thought on this? Uh, you have a feeling about who the good guy and the bad guy is, if any, in this particular squabble? Um, I'm going to keep an open mind. Uh, I think it's only the proper thing to What's do. What's your gut say? My gut say that it's been generally working pretty good the way it has been set up and unless there's a compelling reason to change it which I'm willing to listen and keep an open mind about uh, we'll see what the how it plays out well, but the that, governor's typical you know it's, is, is typical she has a big appetite and then she and then she shies away and and, and and pushes her plate away and IGT 
uh, and, and she got into this deal. I understand it. Uh, by the way, Bob Vincent, the chair of IGT, will be here on Monday. Make a note of that. Uh, they asked for a review because they're coming to, uh, you know, three or four years is close to an end of a contract for them. They wanted to see whether or not uh, the business was going to be uh, the same. She constructed a deal, and of course, the, the urge to have sports gambling, you know, changed the last deal. IGT got a little bit of a break in having to resuscitate the computer system because of what their triage need for sports gaming was. Uh, it's a complicated story in a lot of ways. But the governor threw it the, the governor threw it at the General Assembly and that upsets the speaker, right? Speaker doesn't like when the governor says, "Here, Mr. Speaker," because the spe they don't by, by the way, can you confirm finally? Can you say something that isn't just sweet and pleasant but just <laughs> but just true? The two of them really don't like each other very much and it affects the progress of the state. I will disagree with you. I think there's this Joe, let they the, I, don't like each other at all. Could someone just honestly say no, I, that? I, I, I can they tell. are at each other's philosophical and political throats and keep score on each other daily. The governor has never told that to me and the speaker has never told that to me. What I will tell you, if you want to listen, I'm listening. is that I want to listen. There is I want to believe is what I want to do. I want to believe. There is it's it is only natural to have institutional tension. That's the way that the concept the founding fathers of Rhode Island formed our state constitution and we have the most strongest legislature in the country whereas New Jersey has the most strongest executive but in Rhode Island that's just the way it is it's institutional so you can go back to Governor Speaker Howard, Governor Kachiri, Governor Amon, Speaker DeAngelis, you can go back and forth and you can say the same thing about every speaker and every governor. And I can tell you personally, they have had several numerous uh, friendly, family-oriented dinners over the course of the session, which you don't seem to, you know, the, when I say you, the press don't, doesn't talk about. And if they have any kind of a disagreement, it's on issues. It's not personal. I can tell you that. And I, and I think so. And let me tell you one other thing for the good of the state. Look at the work product that comes out of that process. Will the General Assembly, and it's a good will, work will the General, will the General Assembly get together right after Labor Day to look at this contract? I don't know if we'll get together. I, I think we'll have mo more than likely some hearings in, from the Finance Committee. So and there's I, no urgency? I, when I, when, when, to find the word urgency in the next know. 30 I, I, days? I'm no. saying she wants something in the fall. She wants a ratification of the contract. I'm asking, is it going to happen? Or is it, will, I, will I a decision on it come from the General Assembly in the fall? I, I don't know if it, the actual uh, General Assembly will reconvene or not. As you know, our, we don't have a place to reconvene to right now. The entire state house is being remodeled. If we had to meet somewhere, we'd have to meet out, outside of the state house. There's probably a you know elementary school in Providence you could use. Some of those should be empty. At this I was point. I was thinking of the old state house on Benefit Street, up maybe to Newport. Well, tell me this. I mean, that would be cute, actually. That yeah. would be kind of fun. Uh, speaking of Providence, I know this is not your purview, but you are the majority leader of the state of Rhode Island. Uh, of the House. Well, yeah, the we majority call. leader mm -hmm. of the House, the state of Rhode Island. Okay. Thank you. Um, thought on what's going on in the city, and if the governor asked for a special session for an acute tightening of the Crowley Act, the tool that the state's going to use to take over the city schools. Uh, would you be open to that? Would the speaker yes. be open to that? Yes. No. But she hasn't asked yet, and I, you know, we have to wait to see what they ask. And uh, we, you know, it's a very serious problem. And let me tell you why it's. Do you serious. believe the Crowley Act is sufficient enough? At the present time, yes, I do. Why? Uh, because it's working right now. There's a problem, and the exercise. What do you mean it's working? They just they. Do, no, she hasn't even come up with an idea underneath it. No, but the the mechanism of, of having a Crowley Act to take over a school system is being implemented. It's really a, it's really a, the precedent is for taking over schools, not school systems. I would submit to you that it is wholly inefficient. Not it's not necessarily the General Assembly's fault. Mm -hmm. You know, Representative Crowley got rest him, was an education guy and got I think a formula for crisis. Triage, you know, for a triage, major school yeah. like Hope High School, uh, that didn't go so well long term. I can promise you, it's not good enough. I can promise you, the kind of the wholesale move that the state's got to do, which is literally to move city government out of the way for an extended period of time, it's not in the, it's not there in that Crowley Act. So I'm hoping you guys are open to whatever the commissioner says can, she needs. I can speak for myself and say absolutely yes, because it's a crisis. And let me tell you why it's not only a crisis, which is a tragedy for the children who go to the school, but it's hurting us economically. It's hurting us because a lot of companies don't want to come here because their employees don't want to send their children to a school system that's so bad. And they're looking at relocation. If Last spring, I attended a, um, 
uh, an event at uh, Twin River, and it was for the Rhode Island Foundation, and Neil Stein was talking about how important it is to have a good school system so companies want to come here, so their employees want to come here. Perfect. And you look at all these ratings, p part of those ratings that no one talks about, they talk about economic development, jobs and taxes, but a good portion of those numbers are our school systems. Right. The, uh, the rep does uh, have good news for us, he thinks, in terms of reform on a pension case. We'll talk about that next. So we got a quick reform here. Give me 60 seconds on this, Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, this is the pension reform bill that we passed this year. It's very good. It would help people who are in nonprofit religious pensions to be notified the same way we do in private sector. I worked very hard with the treasurer and the Senate president on this. It's a great piece of legislation and it helps prevent at least the debacle that those sat, sadly those people suffered at the St. Joseph's. How many more of these potential situations do we have, do you think? I hope not, no, very few, but we have to be diligent. We have to, ha we have to empower people, Dan, to take responsibility of their own situations. You can't wait for the government to get you a pension. You have to know what's going on. And unfortunately for these people, even if they wanted to know, they sh uh, because it was a religious organization or a religious pension, they were exempt from disclosure. And that's a bad thing. I think t disclosure is a very good thing. It's the first step to being educated and to know where you are and then to take action. So we have to disclose. How much dough you got in your campaign account? I don't know exactly, a but it's, load, it's right? a significant amount. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Credit to you, credit to the people who support you. Where are you going to spend it? Don't know yet. Thinking? No, I'm very happy where I am. I said it earlier, and I mean it sincerely. I'd be very happy to stay in You're the You're going to be like, you know how they say, well, he's like the golfer who's you know the best player ever never to win a major. Are you like the best fundraiser never to win for a big office? Is this, is, you is, know, is, running, you got, you got $2 million now. No, well, I is he going to use it? Nah, no. he's gonna, just going to keep raising it. Uh -huh. I, uh, I'm, I'm very happy in the House. I keep all my options open, but I enjoy being the majority leader. At some point, you're going to be your own economic bubble. You know, I mean, it's like, what is, what, what is going on here? Uh, Seriously, you have no, you have no yeah, thoughts, uh, you know, I, past, I, I, past this next session. The ne in twenty twenty, I'm running for re-election. Yeah. I can tell you that now. You have an exclusive on that. How's yeah. that? Well, there's no statewide election, so I'm not still sure that I'm going to ask for mm -hmm. front page news on on that one. Uh, well, look, I mean, you're you're a good public servant. People know that, um, and I think that's what the support has 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 been about. It just it makes people curious, right? When you yeah. raise that kind of dough, sometimes you have to say. If there's a critical thought at all, you know, what are you doing? Like, why bother if it's not for a purpose? Don't know yet. It's still early. And as long as people, you know, want to support me, I'm willing to accept it. Um, I think that uh, Rhode Island's a great place. I love it here. If I can do good in another role down the road years from now, we'll take that chance. But right now, I'm very happy being in the house, and I don't see anything changing in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the visit. My pleasure. Good Invite me again. You. I'll come back. You I'd love come to. Come anytime you want. Okay. You got the best suit this month, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Thank final, you. final word when we come back. We'll continue to follow what's going on in the Providence schools. Every week matters, and the commissioner is going to come back in a couple of weeks uh, with a new plan, so stay tuned for that. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee is scheduled for the Wednesday program, has some thoughts on that and some money he's been saving on your electric bills. We shall follow the day's news and bring you all that tomorrow. And, of course, tune in 3 o'clock till 6 on WPRO. Thanks for watching. Good night.